Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here this evening. As I'm sure you've noticed for some of the regular faces I see here this evening, we are in a slightly different venue. We are usually over at Charles Court House, but this evening we are over in Senate House for our first event of the Information Law and Policy Center's seminar series for this term. Um, for those of you who I haven't met, my name is Nora Lee Lidjohn. I'm director of the Information Law and Policy Center here at the Institute for Advanced Legal Studies. Um, we're delighted that you are able to join us here this evening for from Archive to Database, Reflections on the History of Laws Governing Access to Information. So we tend to get through quite a lot this evening in terms of access to information and freedom of information and also biometrics, data protection law. And joining us this evening to have this really exciting conversation is a very fantastic panel. First of all, we have Professor Catherine O'Regan, who is director of the Bonero, Bonavero excuse me, Institute of Human Rights at the University of Oxford. Next, we have Joe Pedder, who's head of engagement at, from the Information Commissioner's Office, who's come down all the way from Manchester for this evening, so thank you so much, Joe. After that, we have Dr. David Goldberg, who is senior visiting fellow here at the Institute for Advanced Legal Studies. He is also a fellow too at the Institute of Computers and Communications Law at Queen, Queen Mary's College. And then finally, not last at all least, we have Dr. Richard Danbury, Associate Research Fellow here at the Information Law Policy Centre and also Lecturer in Law at Dumanford University. And it doesn't stop there, everyone. We also have John Sheridan joining us from Head of Legal at the National Archives, who will also be contributing in as a discussant for this evening. So in terms of format, given our very robust panel, we're going to focus on having 10 minutes each for our speakers, and then we'll have a response from our discussant, John, and then we will open it up then for questions and answers afterwards. So I'd like to invite Catherine to start us off. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk particularly from the perspective of South Africa, because as a South African, um, that's what I know best, and I also think it uh, gives us a slightly different perspective on thinking about um, the right of access to information. So the South African apartheid state was a secretive state, and there is much that happened during the period of the apartheid state that we still do not know or understand. And when it came to establishing the new constitutional order, in many ways the new constitutional order, which was in the early 1990s, 1990, between 1994 and 1996, was obviously a complete rejection of the apartheid state racist underpinnings. But it was also a rejection of the way in which the state operated, its way of being. So it was a rejection of the idea of an authoritarian, repressive, and clandestine state in favor of a democracy which the Constitution says is based on the principles of accountability, responsiveness, and openness. So it's not surprising then that when you look at the South African Constitution, in particular the Bill of Rights, you find in it Section 32 of um, the Bill of Rights or of the Constitution, which provides that everyone has the right of access to any information that is held by the state and the information that is held by any other person and that is required for the exercise or protection of rights. So there is uh, unusually in a Bill of Rights not only a, a provision uh, asserting the right of access to information held by the state, but also the um, affirmation of the right of access to information held by private bodies. The Constitution went on to stipulate that the provision of or the right of access to information in Section 32 had to be spelt out in great detail by legislation um, within three years of the adoption of the Constitution. And, um, the state just made that in time with the adoption of a Promotion of Access to Information Act. Um, and that act starts off in its preamble, really saying what I've just said to you, which says that the system of government before the transition to democracy resulted in a secretive and unresponsive culture in both public and private bodies, and that led to an abuse of power and violation of human rights. So that's the sort of... Um, the framework within which the Act is drafted as an antithesis to the situation that existed um, in the apartheid state. I'm not going to talk about uh, the Act in 
great detail, but obviously it provides a system whereby individuals can apply to, for records to both public and private bodies, regardless of when the records came into existence, so it does have retrospective effect back into the apartheid era, um, and it obviously contains a whole series of exemptions. Um, I think it's the way in which it's been approached by the courts, and um, it's important to note is that although the right of access to information is a matter of international human rights law, has its roots in Article 19 of the International Con uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is the right of um, freedom of expression, um, there's no doubt that it plays a foundational or leveraging role in relation to um, the achievement of other rights and into, in relation to the character of the democracy um, of the, that, that is contemplated in the Constitution. And perhaps that's been most best illustrated by a very recent decision of the South African Constitutional Court um, in June 2018, the My Vote Counts decision, which related to political party funding. And the court held that the um, Promotion of Access to Information Act was unconstitutional in that, that it did not explicitly provide for voters to have the right to demand access to information about political party funding, both from political parties and from independent candidates. And it held that, um, therefore, the, um, all information that relates to funding for political purposes must be both recorded, preserved, and made reasonably accessible. This is a very powerful judgment on the idea of right of access to information, which um, the political consequences of which I think we are still going to experience. But there's been no, there's been a lot of controversy in South Africa about the sources of political party funding, as there is in many democracies. And I think this was a very powerful indication of the kind of role that Section 32, together with the political rights, I think Section 19 of South African Constitution, can play. But that can make may lead you to think, oh, this is a you know wonderful happy story. Actually, the reality of our access to information has been a frustrating uh, and at times um, impossible process. And South Africa does not rate highly if you look at it across a range of democracies that do preserve right or have uh, access to information legislation. Um, there are lots of problems in getting access to information. And very often, people have to apply the course, which is obviously a very expensive process. Nearly all of those applications succeed. Um, so we still have some way to go before we change the culture of a state, which was um, clandestine and secretive in character leading up to 1994. And although we now have, legally speaking, some pretty strong rights, the actual practice of implementing them is still not, not uh, well, well established. So that's just on the right of access to information. Then I want to talk briefly about the biometric state because in your little flyer you talk about Keith Breckenridge's work on the biometric state in South Africa. Um, and he really describes in very interesting detail in his book, which has just been republished actually in 2018, and how South Africa was one of the first countries in the world to employ biometric data as a technique of government and the, obviously the data, datum concerning <coughs> fingerprint. I started off at the very beginning of the 20th century, the early, decade, the first decade of the 20th century, resulted in a great fight by Mahatma Gandhi with the South African state, very famous story in South Africa resisting the racist application of biometric data. Interestingly, um, this, the state has always collected, um, very, uh, always required people to carry in, in identification cards and more recently carry, um, have biometric data collected. And in the 1990s, this really became to be used in a more progressive format, which was for enabling people to get access to pensions, to social pensions, uh, grants from the state. And here it's important to realize that South Africa is a relatively weak state with a very large population living rurally and, um, and was struggling to get old age pensions out too. Um, and in many ways, the use of biometric data to, for the payment of pension grants was promoted by NGOs who said this will make it quicker. You'll be able to um, um, you'll be able to get social grants to people, and so that's the sort of current story of it. But it's led um, to further problems. Another very recent judgment of the court talking about the fact that the bi use of biometric data for social grants may not be used for any other purpose, so very GDPR in its in its uh, in its principles, and particularly may not be used 
by agencies who are providing social grants in relation to debt, uh, which had started to emerge, or had emerged <coughs> quite strongly. Um, people would say, okay, we're paying your pension grant, at the same time we can give you debt, and we'll collect back on the same car that you collect your, your pension grant on, the repayments on your debt. And the court said that they built a line between that practice um, and the grant making pension grants. <coughs> That's a, just a small part of a big global story that is happening in India, for example, under the Aadhaar system, in China under the social credit system, which is the increasing use of both biometric data, social grant practices, commercialization of access to the data held by the state for those purposes. And really what I want to say about that is that I think we still need to build a normative architecture to address the concerns that arise from big data and the biometric state, which will probably need us to combine both privacy, access to information, and principles of administrative law. Because I don't think that uh, we've really done all the work that needs to be done in relation to thinking about what we should do about the state um, holding both biometric and other data um, um, going forward. I, I mean, privacy is obviously important, but I don't think it's all there is to it. The final thing I just want to say very quickly about the archive, because there's no doubt that, firstly, we had a problem in South Africa because it was a clandestine state. What happened was there was a lot of destruction, or there appears to have been a lot of destruction of data, of paper data, leading up to the first democratic elections. So there are quite large gaps in our um, archive. But also that that very period, which was the early 1990s, was the time when a lot of things started being done electronically at, um, for the first time. And the, um, the databases upon which those were captured were very early forms of database, not easy from an archiving point of view. And we have actually lost a lot of information. I've been very involved in a project which has been trying to capture the history of constitution making in South Africa. And again and again, we find that um, you know records that were kept electronically are either um, com you know being completely corrupted, no longer available, or need to be transferred into more current forms of, um, of uh, data management system, which is hugely costly. So, thinking about archives going forward, I think is a big question. Certainly, I think thinking about archives in, in perhaps weaker states, uh, less um, less. Um, informationally competent states like South Africa in that key period between about 1990 and possibly even as late as 2005, we may find that in a lot of those countries have lost a huge amount of their history because the systems of data capture at the time were not really um, ready for archiving and are made it very difficult to capture in archive ways. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Kate, you covered an incredible amount of ground there, and I think it's it's a very interesting dilemma that a country like South Africa is in, in terms of the point you made at the end, grappling with how to update the challenges of having all these legacy systems of the capturing and storage and retention of data, but then having them needing to be then compliant with these 21st century tools of governance under, say, GDPR or the South African equivalent, um, the Protection of Personal Information Act. So I think it's very important, as you mentioned, a role in your talk, you know, to, to note the jurisprudential developments, what has been, you know, such a landmark achievement for South Africa, but then also situating it in what's also been happening in practice, um, because without proper enforcement and supervision, the, the law can only really affect people's rights so far. So, so on that note of enforcement, Joe, <laughs> we'll uh, turn yeah. it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation to attend. I'm uh, really keen to take back some of the ideas that we can generate and feed that back into to our team based campaign and so, um, going forward. Just um, for anyone who's not, not aware, uh, the ICO's role, the Information Commission is the UK's independent regulator. Um, for information rights law, and our remit it covers GDPR, uh, freedom of information, environmental information regulations, DPA 2018, it goes on and on the list, but so it's not exhaustive, but those are the sort of primary um, pieces of legislation. <coughs> our mission is to uphold information rights in the public interest, promoting openness for, by public bodies and data privacy for individuals. Um, and just briefly, my background is uh, I've been at the ICO since 2004. 
um, just before the right of access came into effect in 2005, and initially working on some of the uh, complaints that we received before I moved over to the, to the policy side of things, dealing with the interpretation of the legislation, uh, our external guidance, etc. So, so from a regulatory point of view, um, I've seen how the legislation has bedded down with its implementation, some of the challenges it's faced and that it's actually survived, um, and how it needs to continue to evolve in light of uh, the rapidly changing landscape that we exist in. Um, what I was hoping to do now is just really to share a few thoughts of why, about why FOI is still really important, um, and to point to some of the areas that we're particularly um, looking at and the impact um, and of the shift from paper records uh, to data and digital in the work that we do and um, how we're working to shape how public institutions create, manage and disclose information um, to bolster transparency and confidence in public services. So why is the why important? I think some of the other speakers may be able to speak to this, but um, information is an asset um, and it's particularly in, in important, um, increasingly important in a data-driven economy, it's really the lifeblood of it. Um, and in public life, information brings power to those who control it. Um, and that control and conditions around which institutions um, affects how institutions function. Um, and in our system, Parliament and Judiciary play their respective roles in terms of oversight, but that does have its own limitations. Um, Parliament's limited in its ability to oversee individual exercise of authority, and the courts focus mostly on things that are brought uh, to them. And I think this points to a continuing role for FOIA, given um, to help keep many of the arms of the executive branch accountable through the right of access to information. One of the primary goals of the legislation um, is to help level the playing field and reduce the government's monopoly on, on information. And it provides a really good mechanism for citizens and media um, and civil society to access information so that they can really scrutinise and challenge some plethora of decisions across um, the actions of a number of public authorities of varying, varying different sizes, from those that impact right on the local level, right up to central government. <coughs> Um, the role FOI plays is evident, but so is the need for regulators and the government to remain quite nimble and in innovative um, in our approach to information access as the landscape does shift and as citizens' expectations and demands also change. Um, what we've seen is that public appetite for information and the desire to hold public bodies to account hasn't abated. Our complaints volumes are increasing. Um, and we currently receive around 5,000 freedom of information complaints a year. So that's adjudicating on decisions that have been made about access. Um, and compliance levels remain varied, um, often a reflection of the amount of investment and focus of a particular organisation and the actual FOI handlers have put into good information management, accountability, and transparency. Um, and the culture and knowledge and cooperation with the staff involved when we're dealing with a complaint is, uh, is key to, to how we experience that process. Um, we've seen the shift, the, the impact of the shift away from paper records and greater digitalisation um, has had in our casework. Some of the issues aren't new um, and did arise when the legislation was first implemented and people started to make complaints. I know I dealt with a case relatively early on that looked at whether or not the right extent to a fully working uh, economic, digital economic model. Um, but the complexity and the frequency of the issues connected to digitisation have increased. Um, I think we see more challenges now from citizens making complaints that focus on things like the search terms that an organisation has used when it's dealing with a request for information. Um, so there's a greater level of sophistication expected of public authorities in that regard. And that means as the regulator we also have to increase our own technology knowledge um, to be able to keep pace with the developments so that we can understand and investigate from a more informed position. We're increasing our internal technology expertise and we've got a technology strategy really that uh, sets out what we're going to do in this space. Um, key to that is scanning the horizons to really understand new technologies um, so that we can get in before public devices where um, in the data protection side of things and also to understand how this impacts on, on records and youth rights of access and upskilling is central to that. Moving on to some records management issues. That's uh, increasingly a prominent part of our work, given the need to make decisions about what information is held, whether appropriate searches have been made, um, and whether actually on parts of publicity's information is being destroyed in line with policies and procedures. 
and the exponential growth in data capture and rapid deployment of new technologies is an ongoing concern for us. Um, one particular example that we've seen that came in actually primarily through, through a complaint <coughs> case work coming through um, was around the WB sort of collaborative tools, so tools like Slack and Yammer, um, which obviously bring lots of benefits and efficiency savings and facilitate discussion rules and, and public service, but they do pose some challenges in terms of compliance and records management and access. And we're keen to think more about the concept of information access assessment, so a bit like privacy by design, but transparency by design, connected with some of those, of those issues. <coughs> the nature and complexity of digital records also pose uh, archival challenges, particularly in terms of the assessment of what might have value um, and what influences records appraisal and selection. Um, information and archives take on a particular importance once personal touch with a particular period has ceased. Uh, so this is as true today as ever, with the increase in uh, the nature, the host of the media that information is held in, the movement of information around the globe, um, with sometimes questionable confidence and uncertain permanence. I think some of those issues have been mentioned and I'm sure will come again. Our focus is that key decisions that might be made by something like, for example, instant messages, um, really do need to be captured and properly assessed and, and caught and the information commission has spoken publicly before about her concerns in this area and the need to consider whether or not there, there is any uh, requirement should be any requirement for a duty to, to document in those circumstances and i think that will be a feature of some of our advocacy work uh, in the future um, another area that we're sort of looking at is the, the impact of changes in public service delivery um, which, which again presents challenges from an archival perspective because there's no guarantee that organisations that um, the different the variety of organisations that the private sector provided so that, uh, that fulfil public functions um, have the same sort of a system, systematic approach to records um, or that their, their objectives and intentions would be aligned with the public interest goals and of government or private practice. Um, and as well as archive issues, it also presents it threatens the right rights of access. Um, one of the primary projects that my team work on at the moment is a report to Parliament that we're to lay next year, early next year, um, making the case for that there is a trans gap, transparency gap that's arisen as a result of the way that public services are delivered, um, particularly around private sector providers, um, as well as the limited success of voluntary proactive transparency initiatives. And in particular, we're finding that where a request is made to a public authority and it has outsourced its uh, public function, there is a great deal of complexity in making a decision about whether or not that information is held by that provider on behalf of the public authority and you get into quite contracted uh, issues around the contract provisions themselves. And despite some of the work we did back in 2015, making the case for improving that situation, we're finding that there hasn't, that hasn't really worked as well as we've hoped. Um, so we're likely to make recommendations for some legislative changes around Section 3 of FOIA and what is held on behalf of to make it clear that any um, information that's generated as a result of a contract um, for providing public services with a public private sector provider is actually held for the purposes of FOIA, so there's at least the potential for the public to gain access, um, as well as potentially using the Section 5 designation order capability to, to actually designate some of the larger providers, private sector providers, has got some sort of experience of this in a broader reach, but um, to bring those private sector providers in scope directly so that people or systems can make requests uh, straight to them. So that, those are some of the uh, issues as well as making sure that there's a requirement to routine <coughs> review uh, who's covered by the legislation. Just, just briefly, um, international cooperation um, is also key. We've provided quite a lot of support to a range of countries that have introduced their own access legislation. Um, we can't forget this is South Africa, come to learn really about our experience of implementation and some of the challenges like digitization that we still um, are facing. But I think we think that in the current context, there's a need for a more formal way of collaborating internationally on those issues that are pressing in from data and general digitisation is 
in that camp. So we're doing a lot of work with the International Conference of Information Commissioners just to try and formalise some of that work and, and allow us to work collaboratively. Uh, there's also the open data uh, issue as well, I think it's worth some consideration. So how um, expectations of citizens to be part of the policy making around data um, and also looking at how successful some of those proactive and voluntary mechanisms are. I think from our particular perspective, we're looking at revisiting the concept of publication schemes and seeing how effective those actually are and they're at now. Um, I think we just think that they really often have been particularly well used and it tends to be an organisation's website or database to look at the information it provides. Um, so it's a bit of a little sort of tour of what we're, we're doing. We're trying to combine a lot of this work under a new FOI strategy and we've got a few to a new director uh, for FOI her name's Jill Bull and she'll be pulling a lot of this together um, and trying to take it forward in the future. Thank you so much, Joe. That, that <laughs> really was a okay, whistle yeah, yeah. stop tour. There's uh, so much covered there. Um, but also um, some really interesting overlaps as well in terms of the points that Kate was making earlier on. I think that it's really interesting to see you know, these demands from the public about how sophisticated the public sector is expected to be now in terms of how it delivers services, in terms of how much access to information it should be providing, the speed at which it should be providing it. But then, on the other hand, in terms of the public sector being able to do this, it then perhaps relies more on the capacity or the potential of the private sector in order to help it in that task. And then by extension, as you, as you raised um, so clearly, there's a whole raft then of challenges that come with that. You've got the transparency questions because you've got intellectual property questions, for example, for some of these companies. Um, you have the issues then for archiving, if services are using Slack to coordinate meetings and exchanges, and if, uh, I mean, it didn't come up in your talk, but um, another key issue too is uh, medical officials using WhatsApp in hospitals, you know, what also happens to accessing that information. And as much as, you know, it should be enabling the enhancement, the transparency by design principle that you mentioned of these rights, it then also impinges a lot on the long-term accountability that access to information is, is meant to provide as well. So, following on from, from that, <laughs> which is, a, don't worry Richard, no, you're a better man, but a, a tough, tough, tough enough act to follow, but Richard is a professor of media law, he has a vast amount of experience as well working in the industry of media for the BBC, and in addition to that, it's always wonderful to have Richard back here, the fellow at the centre. So, are you ready, Richard? Wait, you, you, you stole my thunder a little bit because I was going to start with a guilty admission that you introduced me as a lecturer in, in law. I'm not, I'm a lecturer in journalism. Uh, but and, you were lectured in law, Cambridge. Of course. Um, but my main job is that uh, I, I teach people to be investigative journalists. So, I come at freedom of information law um, from a particular angle, which is kind of important to set out right at the beginning. Um, but I research in the area, obviously. Um, and I thought I'd start by picking up on something um, which has been mentioned, but just throw a little anecdote to emphasise the point, which talks directly to, I think, what um, one of the things we're supposed to be talking about is the, the changing nature of information and how it's stored, and how we deal with that phenomenon from a point of view of people who are seeking to get hold of information. Um, and it's been mentioned about the change from paper to digital. Um, uh, and there's an anecdote um, which emphasises some of the difficulties involved, involved in that. I was, when I was working for the BBC, I was working on a programme which was involved in looking at a terrorist incident, uh, and my task was to go away and listen to the whole of the output of the BBC World Service on the day after September the 11th, because one of the person who was alleged to be a terrorist had called into one of the BBC's international call-in programmes. So I went away to the Bush House, it was still in Bush House, and I went away into this, um, this basement bunker where the whole of the, uh, the, the World Service's output for the day after September 11th was stored. And it was all stored on uh, data um, CD-ROMs. And here's the point of the story, two-thirds of them were corrupt. And I was the first person who had ever listened to them, and I bet I'm the only person to have ever listened to them. And two-thirds of them were corrupt, and that, that record is now gone, it does not exist. The BBC only stores it on data DVD. Uh, CD-ROMs, and they've got, leaving aside the fact that CD-ROM, which is now a very, very old form of technology. 
which raises the problem um, about storage, uh, which both of the previous speakers have mentioned, and which we're all aware of. Um, and as my aunt says, my aunt's an archivist, my aunt always says, uh, we know how long parchment lasts. It lasts about a thousand years, or two thousand years, if you have traditions give or take. We don't know how long word documents last. Um, this is a phenomenon. This is a problem. That was the first point. Um, but I'm going to go off that from the kind of uh, granular and, and take one step back, because I, I, mean, I was intrigued by the brief. Um, because one of the things we were asked to do was revisit the idea and political value of access to information laws, predicated on the idea that there's this, 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 this transition from paper to data. Um, so what I thought I'd do is I would go back and have another look um, uh, and wave a flag for a way of conceiving of freedom of information and access to information laws, which isn't necessarily based on the argument from democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll explain why in the end, but that's just setting out my stall. Now, Obviously, freedom of information or access to information is important for democratic reasons. It allows people to get access to information which hold the executive's feet to the fire, um, as both of the previous speakers said. Um, and if you go and look at any of the uh, most significant uh, national or international or regional documents uh, which set up freedom of information or access to information regimes, that is set out as a preamble uh, or as a recital or in the preparatory materials or whatever it happens to be. One vaguely at random, uh, the Council of Ministers' recommendation 2002 to the Council of Europe explicitly says um, that considering the importance of the pluralistic democratic society of transparency in public administration, the ready availability of information on issues of public interest, and it goes on to explain that it's a good idea to have free information. So it's there. But what's the problem? Why? What was the problem? Are there any problems with freedom of information being grounded in a rationale for democracy? Well, there are problems. There are uh, three problems. One is it doesn't apply everywhere. Second, it doesn't apply always. And third, it doesn't necessarily apply. So we'll deal with everywhere, for example. Um, I did produce um, some, some, some PowerPoints, but we're not using PowerPoint. I have to show you this. Um, I don't know if you can see it right at the back, but this is a photograph. Uh, this is the most widely I've ever been seen in my life. Um, this is when I was uh, attending the Price Moot, which is an international media law moot in China, which is now under Kate's jurisdiction. Um, and China, uh, <laughs> China is under your jurisdiction. <laughs> Powerful lady. Um, and it was in China. And uh, uh, the point about me is that I was just managed to photobomb the back of the court, back of the, the shot, and I just appeared in the corner there. It was so difficult to the screen grab of it. Um, but the point being this is that it illustrates, obviously, that if you have a system which isn't based on Western liberal democracy or participatory democracy as we understand it, then your argument for freedom of information is less powerful. Um, the point, therefore, is that the democratic rationale doesn't apply everywhere. It doesn't apply always. Um, you don't have to go too far back in history, um, and I've got a couple of quotes from the 17th and 18th century. Um, where actually accessing information which we would now consider to be important to access was actually uh, something which we'd allowed to imprison. Uh, one example, um, uh, someone I've done a little bit of research on is a uh, uh, founder of a newspaper called the Gloucester Journal, which was set up in um, uh, the early 18th century. Um, and he, in his newspaper, published a report about a debate in Parliament uh, since 1728, for which he was sent to prison. And he was sent to prison because he was publishing information which the public shouldn't have a right to understand. Um, I found the actual uh, copy, his own copy of the newspaper in archive. There we go, a paper right there. Uh, and it's got a little manuscript, a note above it saying the woeful paragraph, uh, which we presume is in his hand. So, not everywhere, not always, and not necessarily. The last point is that. Um, the strongest argument for freedom of information is when you have a system based on uh, deliberative democracy, where individuals are fed information and assess it, and therefore work out what to do in times of uh, um, uh, political uh, um, uh, dilemmas. And yet, if you don't necessarily have a deliberative democracy, but if you have something which is more of a representative democracy, so in other words, we elect people and they make the decisions up for us, then the argument for freedom of information or access to information is more curtailed. It's only strongest when the information being sought is relevant to democratic decisions. It's weaker in other situations. So, although I'm not saying it's a, 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 an irrelevant or a poor argument for freedom of information, I'm just saying there is scope for another one. 
Um, and the other argument, the second argument, is based on autonomy, the autonomy rationale, uh, which those of you who, uh, yeah, many in this room would have read into freedom, uh, ex uh, freedom of expression or the principles behind it, can see it's one of those rationales which people talk about as why it's important for freedom of expression to exist. Um, and a guy, Yokai Benkler in Harvard, ha um, came out with in his book, The Wealth of uh, Networks, he came out with a proposal that you can also ground all of information law in the notion of autonomy. And his argument was this, that information um, can control people's access to, uh, information law can control people's access to information on the basis of this, they make decisions about what to do with their lives, or it can control the range and variety of information on which people can make decisions to do things in their lives. And it's those decisions, those decisions about what to do with your life, that's the place where autonomy resides. Autonomy is, he would define it as, the ability to make informed decisions about what to do. He gives examples. He gives examples of uh, information law being able to control people um, by, uh, for example, uh, content regulations on, uh, on newspapers. He gives an example um, uh, of uh, information which can control the ranges of uh, uh, options available to people. Um, but I was thinking of a different one, which links back to South Africa again, which is the South Africa's Bantu Education Act of 1953, very well known, uh, which was an information, which was a piece of information law which curtailed the ranges of options available to a certain section of the community. Um, Heinrich Bavert famously said, what is the use of teaching the Bantu child mathematics when it cannot use it in practice? So these are examples of what uh, Benkler would say uh, information law could curtail. So how does freedom of information law fit into this? Well, it can provide a way of challenging those controls. So freedom of information law can control, can challenge the control of information being supplied, and it can challenge the control of the range and variety of information law that's provided. And to use the second example, perhaps, uh, freedom of information law can provide a reason for, chat, for providing access to maths textbooks or restrictive political texts or whatever it happens to be and therefore allow people to flourish, allow people to make autonomous choices. So, so what? I've, I, I've uh, briefly sketched out an autonomy-based rationale for freedom of information, or not democratic one, so what? Well, i just highlight four things it can be used for. The first is, it provides a rationale, the Chinese example, it provides a rationale for freedom of information, a right of freedom of information, in societies which don't necessarily uh, consider themselves to be democratic, or we wouldn't find them, because we don't tell them to be democratic. It provides a, a, um, a rationale for, for, for access to information based on the <coughs> means, don't need the political structure of democracy. A second, uh, and you can see where this is coming, it's not necessarily based on a strong deliberative democracy uh, argument. It, it provides a rationale for access to information based on autonomy, even when you are, don't uh, live necessarily in a, deli a deliberative democracy, but a more of a republican or, or, or representative democracy. Third reason why this might be useful. Um, it's been mentioned earlier on by an earlier speaker. Um, many private actors have information which are relevant and useful and important to us beyond merely democratic reasons. Um, and uh, autonomy-based rationale for freedom of information would provide us with a reason that private actors, should we think about Facebook, should we think about Google, private actors like that might be compelled to provide us with access to information. Um, and the fourth reason, and I'm just going to leave this briefly, is it's always struck me as slightly perplexing because I teach information law on, um, <coughs> uh, on, an, on an LLM. Uh, and I teach freedom of information law, and everyone else teaches uh, data protection law, or breach of confidence law, official secrets law, privacy law, misuse of private information law. And I always feel like I'm the outlier. Uh, I'm the one saying, yes, this is how you can have information. Everyone else is saying, no, this is how you can keep information. And it's always struck me as slightly perplexing that you have this kind of Janus face approach. Um, one bit of information law is, seems to be diametrically opposed to the other. Thinking about information law from an autonomy perspective, I think probably gives you a way of uniting the, 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 the detention with it. <coughs> it provides you obviously with a rationale for privacy law, for data protection law, but it also can provide you with a rationale for freedom of information law. Now, that's not necessarily going to mean there are not be conflicts. Of course there'll be conflicts between one individual's autonomy and another, 
for example, the gentleman who was named in Parliament this afternoon, um, uh, and the people whose autonomy be affected. Uh, well, I can report uh, using qualified privilege uh, the uh, statement by Lord Hayne in Parliament, assert, uh, which he said, um, asserting absolute privilege, that it was, um, what's his name? Uh, Tommy Green. Matt, Bill Green. Uh, I, I don't stop this at all. Um, so that was the final point. The Freedom of Information can give you a, a reason, so it can give you a, a way of, a, of kind of providing a unified field theory for information. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. That really does provide us with a really fantastic philosophical underpinning for all of the conversations that we've been having today. And I really liked your idea of waving flag for access to information, not just for the purpose of ensuring democracy and democratic safeguards, but also this, this idea of the autonomy rationale. I, I, I would be very honest, we can talk about this more, uh, maybe over wine later, I'm not entirely convinced, um, in terms of the autonomy rationale, particularly in China, because ultimately it leads to this notion of self-determination and ultimately the acknowledgement or celebration of the individual. So I was wondering whether it maybe feeds back into the more holistic uh, framework that Kate Regan mentioned earlier on about you know, fusing all of those different areas of law that you talked about earlier on and maybe looking more at like other international regimes that you know don't specifically focus on democracy. So say for example, the UN Sustainable Development Goals Framework, where ultimately the goal there is, as you mentioned earlier on, that the ultimate so autonomy, you know, it's there's a means to the end, but then the philosophical rationale then is is flourishing or dignity that underpins privacy and freedom of expression. But I do you think this is giving us lots of scope for, for discussion for, for afterwards. So rather than, than uh, abuse my privilege as chair, let's move on to insights from David Goldberg. Thank you very much. I'm not sure I would dignify, but will dignify what I'm going to say with insights. But I, I will maybe sort of segue a bit into uh, what Richard has said about looking at the sort of the brighter context. For example, one of the things I always uh, teach my students um, is, when I do this kind of stuff, is that there's a very, in my opinion, undernoted driver for access to information, which is, well actually there's two. One is consumer law and consumerism. Because in the 1950s, which was before the American FOI law in '66, Nader and Naderism and other such persons were demanding to know what was inside machines that consumers bought. Think of which magazine in the UK. What's in? How can we compare? How can we know what to spend our 1950s? You know, you've never had it so good. Money on. Uh, in terms of washing machines or cameras and so forth, if we can't get inside them and compare their performance, for example. And I think consumerism, so I'm picking up on your point about let's not tie this too much, please, to democracy. Not irrelevant, I know, but I like to, and the, the other one, of course, is the green movement, because the Greens, to the chagrin of the Freedom of Information campaign, in the UK, which I have worked for since 1984, failed to really notice the environmental information regulations that came into effect and force in the UK, and actually as European law are superior to the UK Freedom of Information Act, because they're, 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 they're European law. So the environmental impact assessments and the Urhus Treaty and the, 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 the implementation mechanism which it sets up. So I would say greenism and consumerism. So I think we should have quite a rich you know, uh, array of dishes on our a la carte menu here as to what it is that drives. 
Um, let me uh, hope that everyone has this page with the quote from my hero Peter Forschel, a catalyst for the first freedom of information law in Sweden in 1766. He wrote this in 1759 <clears throat> in his then banned book, Thoughts on Civil Liberty. And he basically says, and here's another sort of rationale, which is not a million miles away from democracy, and that is, if people are to be free allowed to contribute to society's well-being, then it's important that society's state of affairs become known to everyone. So you can't contribute, you can't participate. Now that's not a million miles away from democracy, but I think it's broader, because if we, you know, democracy tends to be more of a political focused uh, contribution, but this is much more general. So if there's nothing else you do before you drift off tonight, uh, please read the whole quote and uh, so on. And whilst I'm in the business of quoting, you see, you mentioned autonomy, and one thing I'd like to just cite is section one, and I'm sorry, of the Freedom of Information Scotland Act. <laughs> you may have slept down from Manchester, but others, have, others of us have come considerably further. And, and so for me, FOISA, the Freedom of Information Scotland Act, is the key, uh, my key uh, statute. And section one, paragraph one says, a person, very politically correct, a person who requests information from a Scottish public authority which holds it is entitled to be given it by the authority. Now, that's section one. And there are just a couple of quick things to point out to you there. First of all, it's not dependent on you being a citizen or residence or domiciled. Uh, it's anyone, anywhere can use this law. Secondly, um, they are entitled to be given it, of course, subject to those blinking exemptions, <laughs> which are the bane of all uh, FOIA ad activists' life. But I would like just to focus in on one thing before I move on, and that is the word requests. I met a guy in Budapest a couple of years ago who said that he had fronted a campaign to get rid of the equivalent word in the Hungarian legislation because he said, how sort of servile and cringy is it? <clears throat> you know, may I please have? It's a bit sort of Dickensian, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the guy going up for another, what's his name, you know, the... Oh, Oliver oh, Twist, it's very Oliver Twistish. Please, sir, may I please have? And um, he actually fronted a campaign to say, we've got to find a much more robust word than requests. So I just, I just uh, uh, add that. Whilst I'm on the early bit of, because I saw history as a word in here and I can't get over 1760s and so forth and so forth. I want to make two points about the first freedom of information law, 1766, which this center put on a splendid show uh, two years ago to celebrate its 250th anniversary in the Free Word Center down in, uh, in London here. And the two things I want to point out are, number one, that it was short-lived. By the 1774, it was finished, because you had Gustav III, who had completely subverted the Age of Liberty. So although we lodged Sweden, and James, God bless him, author of The Politics of Secrecy, if you haven't read that, there's a good book uh, for bedtime as well. Um, it was very short-lived. It only lasted a few years in which the counter-revolution set in. And I think that gives us, you know, food for thought in the sense that those of us that are in the business of FOI in our different sort of ways know that this is a never-ending battle. This is a, you don't enact a law. Whether it's a, why was once called a fundi in South Africa? That's pretty good, isn't it? That means an expert because I was down doing a seminar on this protection bill, but it was still a bill. And so, um, you know, you, it's always an uphill struggle. You're never done before there are people who are trying to push the boat back. It's not linear, it's not one way. And it's, that's a significant point to remember about Sweden, which likes to vaunt the fact that it was the first country that had this law. It's not as quite as keen to tell you as to how short-lived the revolution actually was. The second thing about Sweden, before I quickly move on, 
is that the four most eminent authorities that I know, all Swedes, in the translation of their works into English, say that the enactment of the law was, and here is the word which is, translates their Swedish word, by accident. Really, by accident. In other <coughs> words, it wasn't part of some deep-seated philosophical or value-laden uh, you know, campaign that had the ears and eyes of you know the majority. Let's remember, was it Roy Jenkins who said there's no votes in freedom of information? Nobody ever puts that into their manifesto because they know nobody in the general populace generally cares about freedom of information. So they say it's by accident, meaning that it happened to come around because stuff happens in the real politique of the situation which is great. Now, I think both of these two things sound negative, but I think they're both incredibly positive. A, because it means that this thing can happen anywhere, anytime, because it, it happens by accident, so it can happen through any other sort of uh, conflation of uh, positive uh, political forces. It's not really a dogma thing at all, or a doctrinal thing at all. And the fact that it happens like that is positive. And the fact that you always have to push back against the pushback means that it's something which requires, if that's to invite you to a party, <laughs> make sure that you say, I'm coming. OK? Right. Um, OK. Uh, Sweden's number one. Before I finish, <coughs> who knows what number two was? Nobody ever thinks who got the silver medal. Portugal. I bet. What? Portugal. Well, I don't think so, sir, but I'm more than happy to be corrected. What year was that? I don't know. Oh, well, you're just guessing. No, I see. I've seen can a map. Can I say it should be an there informed is a guess, sir? You can't, just, you, can't, you can't just think up names of countries. <laughs> Probably when you had your last holiday or you would like to go. Yeah, Mauritius or the Maldives. Uh, I don't think so. Believe it or not, it was Wisconsin in 1849. Now, some people have said that's because the Midwest is sort of you know, Scandinavian by, by background, and there could be a link there. But I think that raises a very interesting question about what I call the level of freedom of information. We generally assume that it's a sort of state level, that it's a country national law. But Wisconsin, of course, would be sub-national. And I think that gives the lie to the fact that it... And the third one, by the way, believe it or not, was Colombia in Latin America, 1913 although it picked up on an earlier ordinance which it repealed, uh, which had been repealed in 1888. So, you know, that just, I think, gives you the sort of general picture that it can happen uh, anytime, uh, anywhere. Let me finish by picking up on, and this I think we should probably leave to discussion, I'm so glad that the director of the esteemed Human Rights Centre uh, at Oxford is here, because I'm interested in this issue of moving freedom of information from a constitutional or a legal principle to a fundamental human right. And the question then becomes, what will ground that? What will ground that? Now, I don't buy the argument that it is Article 19 of ICCPR. First of all, Honora O'Neill famously made the point that if you justify rights from quoting legal texts, all you've done is short circuit the justificatory argument. <laughs> right? You're not justifying it, you're just sort of, you know, saying, well, it's got to be that because there's a law about it. But the question is, well, why is it in the law in the first place? So I would conclude by saying that the only person that I know that has ever written, I think, interestingly on this is an American academic called Kate Matheson, in, who in 2013 wrote an article called Access to Information, colon, a human right question mark. And she relies on the work of James Nichol, who I think is a first class, personally, a first class philosopher of the nature and meaning uh, of human rights. And she says that using Nichols' sort of template of human rights being rights which contribute materially to allowing people to contribute to or to affect their circumstances, then this begins to come into the equation because in this context, human beings are endowed with a natural curiosity and capacity for knowledge, that one of the things that they require knowledge for is to facilitate their exercise of all other rights, 
and situations. And so thirdly, that means that in that sense, I'm very truncating this, human rights, uh, uh, right to information uh, in, in, in that sense is a human right. And by the way, she says it's a welfare right, not a liberty right, because a welfare right is a right which obliges governments or other authorities to facilitate access. So it's not just a liberty right for sort of nosy parkers or people who want to interfere. So I'm going to stop there, uh, if that's okay, because I think the time is up anyway. And um, the, the, but, I, but I always say to students, and I'm, you know, my final point is, and then I have one further final point. So my one further <laughs> final point is, oh, no, it's not fair. I'll, I'll bring it up. I'll bring it up. Right, okay, cheers. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, I think we're all winning in anticipation in the Q&A session for the, and, and finally, for <laughs> McDonald's. Uh, uh, sorry, that's an ITV reference for anyone who isn't aware of that. For the, and, and finally, point. But, I mean, you did raise quite a number of significant questions in the past 10 minutes. Everyone was fantastic for time, by the way. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our fundies for keeping very, very closely in time. I think you know, Dave makes a really good point in terms of the importance of emphasizing the origins of freedom of information in terms of consumer laws, in terms of considering the influence that the US's fair information principles have had on, on this area. And also, I mean, I really uh, enjoyed your point about the requesting of information is seemingly like this representation of, of servitude, for example, that it's um, that perhaps it should be perhaps framed as more of a a, a positive obligation. Yes, yeah, there's something that needs to be worked on on that. Right. How to turn it around. By the way, I never did find out, but I did try as to whether the Hungarian campaign has been successful. I actually suspect it has. <coughs> nice try, guys. Uh, but then, you know, there is that ambitious call that you also made about freedom of information becoming a fundamental human right and what that would actually encompass and uh, what difference that would make in practice to the right when you referenced to Nora O'Neill's work in terms of it not being just enough to rely on the sources of the legislation but also testing in practice what is actually happening on the ground, what is actually happening in terms of the due diligence and, and good governance. So I would like to thank all of our fundies on our panel this evening, but before we turn to our Q&A session, we have one last fundy to contribute, and that is John Sheridan, who is our discussor for this evening, so we're delighted he can join us here. Not, not all the way from Scotland, Kew Gardens, but he is uh, oh, some time. Um, so he Taylor is the digital director. director from the National Archives, so we would love to hear your response, John, to all of the really fascinating points and questions that have been raised by our panel. So it's great for me to be here. I have a really cool job, so I get to think about our work as a digital archive um, and a whole bunch of digital services that we provide and we archive <coughs> on the web, do all sorts of really fun, interesting things. Um, and listening to, there were so many points of provocation um, <laughs> and things to respond to. Um, so I'm going to try and be very brief. Um, the UK, we've had public records legislation since 1835, but we've been slow, relatively speaking, to come around to the idea that that should deal with access. Um, we get an access regime in 1958, the <coughs> Act, but we don't get a right of access right the way through to 2000 and the Freedom of Information Act. Now, it's interesting to think about um, this question of <coughs> rights, and particularly right of access, and who gets the rights. To what extent are we having a conversation about the rights of people in the present? And some of these questions of autonomy, um, or the rights of information for a democracy to function, and to what extent are we talking about the rights of people in the future to know? And who says? And who gets to say what rights? What's it possible for the future to know? 
Um, so I think there's some really interesting territory to explore across all the things that, that the panellists have said. Um, balancing the rights of the present and the rights of the future. Um, when I look critically at the legal regime, and my background is, I'm a computer scientist, um, first and foremost. And when I look critically at some of the concepts that are in our legal regime around access, there's this kind of implicit assumption of tangibility that pervades the law that, um, in terms of practice, our use of digital technologies um, confounds, undermines um, time and time again when you come to try and apply the law in practice. Um, we have this habit of simulating um, paper-based processes for making decisions um, in the digital era when it just doesn't add up. Now, the root of the trouble, I think, is something quite deep. Um, uh, now, there's a, there's a bit of theory in um, computing and information called information theory by a genius, um, Claude Shannon. And um, the big concept there, and he's worrying about the maths, about how you send a message. Um, and he talks about um, a thing called information entropy and its kind of counterpart, which is redundancy. Now, he shows that we have a lot of redundancy and you need redundancy in information in order to be able to safely send it somewhere. Now, information redundancy, and we have it in the English language, we have it in any form that we encode information massive redundancy means that we always encode more than we think. So any piece of information has the potential to tell us much more than it purports at face value <coughs> to say. So you, particularly if you can apply a new method to releasing some of its value. And this is why, for example, we find that when you have very large quantities of information, individually meaningless things, but you have a method to be able to release some of its value, suddenly you get an amazing insight. Um, suddenly you can understand something that isn't ostensibly or explicitly stated because of the amount of redundancy that there always is in information. And we're in a very exciting era of artificial intelligence and deep networks and all sorts of things, all sorts of methods that are allowing us to release more of the value that's inherently contained in the information that's making decision making quite hard. It's making decision making hard in government about what's a record and what should be kept. It's making decision making quite hard about if we release this information, um, is it sensitive? All the stuff around mosaic effects and so on and so on all comes right down to this kind of core property of information, which is that there's information redundancy and there needs to be in order for it to be communicable. Um, now, if you layer that on top of this question of balancing rights and for sure the capability that the future will have in ways that we can't predict and um, to be able to release more information from what we have or what we might pass forward, I think you're in a very interesting landscape. So I suppose if you then put that into the mix of um, legal regimes that are designed very much around assumptions in terms of tangibility and how do we essentially build legal regimes that are capable of dealing with digital information, dealing with some of the things that we're doing with it, how do we address questions of on what basis, why is it Autonomy, is it democracy? Um, we're in a very interesting landscape. I don't know the answers to any of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's great fun to spend your time thinking about it and also to, to run into the practical problems. So like, why is this hard? Why are we really struggling to do this? What's making it hard fundamentally? Um, 
And we see that all the time, um, even at the level of apply, you know, making a decision to apply a particular exemption under the FOI. Um, well, how do you know? And what if you invent some new method or something that you thought the exemption wouldn't apply, but now you can release some values and that now it does. Interesting times. Thank you, John. Um, Good luck with summing that up. Let's <laughs> <laughs> take a moment. Well, now we're going to swiftly move on. No, I'm not joking. Um, I think a lot of the key issues that a lot of the panelists have raised complement quite nicely, actually, to the points you were making in terms of we have challenges now in terms of creating legal regimes for the current obstacles that we have in reconciling freedom of information, access, values of autonomy, democracy. <coughs> we're a generation or two of technology behind, I would say, if anything. In terms of the, the conception the that's in our law and the way in which information is being um, created and shared mm -hmm. and used. So perhaps in the next generation or two, we'll already be building the legal regimes for, for the future. We might have more reached that point. Or the, the value systems may, may be different. So lots of food for thought there, everyone. Um, we have half an hour for questions, which I hope you would still be able to join us afterwards for um, offline reception. So I would really welcome any questions that you may have for our speakers. I see a few hands are already up, wonderful. So if you wouldn't mind just briefly just introducing yourself before you pose a question to our panel. Thank you. My name is Tara Tolman. I did an LLM on computer and uh, information law. Uh, so I studied information law, freedom of information, and data protection. And I'm now consulting on information law and a lot of GDPR. My question was about, you mentioned you see conflict between freedom of information, this is the information available, and you access it, and you see um, more a tendency to keep information. What I, I, my impression was there is absolutely today, there is an overlap between the subject access request and the freedom of information, but I have, to, I might have missed something. Um, there is no that, yeah. <coughs> but there's also, it's worth distinguishing between them, since the principle, I think, at least in this subject or argument, the principle behind freedom of information as, a, as an act, as a doctrine, and the idea of whether it exists as a right, is that the presumption is this information is disseminated, um, and there are that presumption is rebuttable when you can provide a reason why an exemption applies, and that's the way the FOI FOIA works in this country. You compare that with the, the, the way that many of the other um, uh, uh, aspects of law which apply in this area work, and the, the, the presumptions are rebutted. The presumption is that the information is curtailed unless it's established sufficiently that the information should be disseminated. Um, a particular example of where this happens is in how the uh, notion of the public interest works in different doctrinal categories, which is something I'm trying to do forever in writing papers that completely fail to do. Um, uh, and if you look at, for example, an employer, the presumption is if the, uh, if the public interest isn't established, then the information public interest in withholding isn't established, then the information is disseminated. You flop that around and look in, for example, breach of confidence law, uh, the presumption is, unless the, the, it's convincingly established that the, the public interest applies, the information is withheld. So, in summary, although yes, there are overlaps, there is a difference in assumption of how the different doctrinal categories works, and that is reflected in particular in, uh, in doctrinal areas, and most notably in the notion of public interest. Thank you, like to add to that, too. <coughs> I think it's an be able to access the information about yourself. Like you obviously there is still exemptions within it, so I think there are some similar principles out there, but I can not hear what you're saying about other other I mean, sorry, can I just yeah. add to that? I mean, it, it, I'm always very, very simplistic and naively saying that FOI is about non-personal name-linked information. 
known personal name link information. <coughs> Whereas the subject access under the data protection is clearly only about the name linked information. No? Well, yes, maybe that didn't help. Right, right. <laughs> it's not where it's the individual. I mean, there's, there's the other overlap about when you have personal information about third parties. Ah, yes, but, but, the, but the requester but yes, is not asking it. about information about him or her. Although you're absolutely right, there are issues over whether the dissemination to that person, although I think Richard's point about the dissemination to the requester is actually the dissemination to the world, yes. is, a, is a really, really good one. And I mean, I'm all in favour of the enhanced use of what is now becoming quite common of disclosure logs. Yeah. Meaning that when an authority discloses information to the requester, it puts up some link or some summary of the information which it has done so on its on its website under its disclosure log uh, uh, site that age. We had a question here. I can I introduce myself? Yes, yes. Thank you. Dr. Copeland and Human Rights. Um, on one hand, we had Cambridge Analytica scandal, 87 million um, individual pieces of data stolen. We've just, I'm sorry, in front of Congress by Zuckerberg. Then we had G GDPR. Then we have this exponential growth in demand for data analysts. So obviously it's good for business. And obviously, um, well, there is either a lack of willingness to introduce specific restrictions for that, or just maybe it's deliberate. Can you find that? Do you, do Did you, you guys not just find Facebook five hundred thousand pounds today or yesterday on this Cambridge Analytica thing? That was a pretty. That was a pretty. Especially compared today. Yeah, that was pretty. That was pretty modest. I would have thought. It was like restricted to the old legislation, the old legislation, which. Yeah, no, I know. I'm just. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Right. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Well, commend the so, assistant. We know that Cambridge Analytica was complicit in Trump's election, so apparently they, well, apparently there are certain plausible sources that inform that there was, uh, well, they had significant role in Trump's win. Maybe. Maybe. So, how about any potential sinister repercussions of that? 87 million. So why? So this is an ongoing investigation. So there may be further revelations once the investigation has concluded. The interim report was published by the ICRA yes, this yeah. year. And the next one is November. Sorry, I'm sure it's going to be Sunday. Yeah. So why should not be super fair? Um, why? Why should his punishment be so lenient? Why should sorry and how many? What was it? Half a million dollars? Of it's half a million pounds. But that's because under the previous, it was the processing that it concerned was under the previous <coughs> legislative yeah. regime, uh, where the maximum is five hundred thousand. So under GDPR, we have um, greater powers now to impose a range of corrective measures, including. Um, up to 17 million pounds or 4% of global spend, and that wasn't available to us under this for this processing because it happened before GDPR came into effect on the 25th of May. Can I perhaps take the question and, and, and give it a spin? I noticed that Tim Cook yesterday suggested that there should be a deed to GDPR in the United States. And, and obviously he didn't specifically say that. He said a more comprehensive privacy law. He yeah, with the very headline, careful he with, his, with his words. <laughs> and would that not be a good thing? Do we think? Uh, I don't know. Would it be better if the the ambit of this kind of this principle, uh, which is enshrined in the GDPR, would apply to where most of these information warehouse companies are based? So just to follow on from that quickly. Um, I was wondering how long it would take us before we would talk so much about the GDPR, but. I think it's very interesting to think about how GDPR, just to bring up the point you made earlier on, Richard, about the issues of jurisdiction, 
where these laws actually work in practice, following on from Dave's point about Onur and Neil's calls for actually looking at how the laws work in practice. And I'd be curious for any thoughts you have on this, Kate, regarding how, so effectively, the new data protection law in South Africa, it was passed while GDPR <coughs> was in the mid, it was midway in its drafting. So you had influences from GDPR, for example. But just to put it in context, you have this now quite sophisticated data privacy law measure, which is the first ever data protection law that a country outside of this European culture of data protection and freedom of information is now developing. Do you think if you were to have a conversation with someone like Tim Cook, that there would be certain aspects that could work very well outside of the EU, or is GDPR generally a, a good idea as an omnibus regime to have? Yeah. Look, I think this is very new legislation everywhere, mm -hmm. and I think we, not only that, but the way the technology is working is, is changing very fast, um, and so for example, the whole idea of anonymization with facial recognition is you know, the, the, the things are happening very fast, and I, I'm sure all of this uh, legislation is going to come under repeated review. And in some ways, that's really what happened with Cambridge Analytica. And it all, it nearly always happens with new technologies. Mm. The law comes along afterwards, yes, you know, yes. thinking about, yes. well, now we've got a new technology, this is how it's working, this is what we have to do. Indeed. And I'm sure we're only at the beginning of this. I think it's, I certainly think the South African legislation will be revisited. Mm. One of my colleagues was off to Mauritius in about two weeks. They also have enacted a piece of legislation which in the, its preamble sort of doesn't actually say GDPR but says this legislation is to you know, deal with kind of cutting edge um, legislation in other parts of the world. And so I mean I think we're just going to see uh, an ongoing conversation of what the legislation should look like. And I don't think we are, you know, I think there's a lot of technological change to come which I think may need revision of all of it. So I think quite I think the question related to that, which is, um, given that we're trying to balance benefits and harms, how good is it that we have diversity of regimes around the world, so we get to run experiments and see what works well, and how much should we be aiming for um, normalisation? So I mean, it's pretty interesting whether this is something that could be dealt with under um, an international convention, for example. And of course, there is a difference here between democracies and those that aren't democracies, but you could imagine that it may well move in that direction. It may, you know, so in some ways the GDPR is happening under the EU 27, and you know that. You still 28. 28. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> still hope. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Um, but you know, so it'll be interesting to see whether that has an influence that could lead to convention and international convention, although that's not happened much with the EU, which is surprising. It hasn't produced that kind of um, initiative. So I think it is possible, and it's certainly, I'm sure, for the, um, for the big platforms, they, wouldn't, they may not like it on the one hand, but on the other, having to deal with South Africa, Mauritius, you know, India, uh, the EU is incredibly complicated for them. Is this ever increasing the amount of convergence really? Mm -hmm. National networks will um, cooperate and give them the data flowing around the world, and that's something we've put a lot of into the application that we have at Mauritius. So, do you discuss with, I mean, I think that's really interesting because I think, um, you know, practical conversation about do you discuss exactly how particular provisions are working and whether they need rethinking or whether there is an unevenness between? You know, different systems. Um, I think there's been, that does come up, but I think it's the focus of the things like the G10 uh, is around how can we work fundamentally to make sure that we're enforcing in the right way and in a consistent way. I think there are things that come up when you're in the European Data Protection Law around looking at the specifics of each regime, where there are differences between the kind of regional issues. So the GPEN is the Global Privacy Enforcement <laughs> Network, for those who aren't familiar with it, that I imagine it's a hugely helpful source for a lot of data protection authorities worldwide. So just to follow up on more questions, so there have been two very patient hands on this side right. of the room. So this is a gentleman here in the maroon jumper, and then there's another lady <laughs> whose next trip is to Portugal in, indeed. Um, 
Hi, I'm, I'm Julian Vetcher. I'm a, a researcher in, in the field of um, uh, rule of law at the moment. Um, it seems to me the point that was made about democracy and the value of it is, is a good one. Um, but the, the welfare benefit of the human rights aspect of information access is something that you can see timing very neatly with the rule of law requirement to make a decision for instance, if a government department wants to consult on something, you obviously need to be able to check what information you're being given, what decision is being made, and then access a, enough information to exercise your right to uh, autonomy. Um, is it, in, in that sense, um, I, th I think that if you look to um, it as more of a, a rule of law issue, um, access to information. Um, you avoid the difficulties with human rights, which is different rights, rules, kind of, you know, running into conflict with each other, and then having to decide the complicated, you have the complex, uh, complex decision as to which right mm -hmm. dominates in a situation. If you put it in a rule of law, <coughs> uh, then that right under the rule of law to information becomes an absolute welfare right rather than, than a complex human law right. I think it's just picking up from what Kate made earlier on about the fact that there's no <coughs> one legal regime that can tackle the challenge of freedom of information. And in terms of the role that the rule of law could play, it certainly has factored in very considerably in terms of how other rights have been interpreted and applied. But I'd be interested if the panel think in what way the rule of law is quite significant to freedom of information legislation generally. I think one of the problems with it is, is it's a term, but once you start trying to define it down and crystallise it, it becomes more ambiguous. Um, and so I'd be interested to know what what is meant by the rule of law in this situation, how you can crystallise out from that principle specific rules. Secondly, I'd be wary of the idea that you can avoid conflicts of rights situations by recasting it as a rule of law, because I think inherent in uh, any law or system of rules that deal with information, you're going to have conflicts, you're going to have to have a way which resolves those conflicts. Um, and I can't immediately see, although you might be right, but I can't immediately see, because I've just been thinking about it for 30 seconds, but I can't immediately <laughs> see uh, how recasting it in the terms of the rule of law would be able to short circuit those conflicts and be able to come uh, to, 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 to provide a, a, a rationale for resolving dilemmas which are predicated on them. Then again, that's 30 seconds. Okay, so we had another question here, this lady, and then a question for Rachel. Ed. Thanks. Uh, Maureen Svensson, Middlesex University. Uh, my question, I suppose, is a little bit of a footnote to the one rule of law. I was wondering if in the mix of the antecedents to the Freedom of Information um, legislation, some uh, mention should be made of the contribution of the common law doctrine of access to evidence, and in particular freedom, um, public interest immunity, which yeah. dominated um, the, the, I mean, which the, provided the, the sort of litmus test for access to information held by government bodies and, um, and state bodies, and um, which at least when it operated op uh, had a, a level playing field, that access to evidence was denied to one side, it was denied to both sides, but yeah. the legislation now is with, in the other direction of the Justice and Security Act, whereby information would just be available on one side. So I wondered if, if, there was, if you thought that there was some input from the common law that would be usefully um, reflected upon in, in, in tracing the sort of origin of these concepts, I mean, obviously access to information, mm -hmm. access to evidence is one of the basic uh, tenets of, of the rule of law, and, uh, and perhaps plays in also to the autonomy, public uh, democracy, because it's almost accidental the information then becomes publicly available just by these, the efforts of one litigant, as it were, but it, it, they, they are it's sort of spin off. I think it directly is. Uh, you're absolutely right. I'd say the reason for the discovery and disclosure of <coughs> obligation is to allow a quality of arms from different sides. Why do you have a lot of quality of arms? It's to allow people to fight on an even level playing field. So yeah, I think there is a there is a common theme, nothing to do with democracy, which 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 you can use to explain the origin of the common law, these these, these common law rules methods and disclosure. Yeah. Well, accidentally, maybe. <laughs> 
Right. It would be accidentally in a way that if... Yeah, well, the, the, the common law doesn't sit down with someone saying, oh, we'll do it for this reason. No. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it, it emerges. Yeah. 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 I, I think there's one other... I mean, I completely agree with you about the <coughs> origins, <coughs> excuse me, actually being more in the access to aspects of the judicial and litigation process. Mm -hmm. I think that's... <coughs> so sorry. <coughs> Historically the case in Sweden, as it so happens, but I think there's another aspect and dimension to your point about the common law, and that is completely open to correction here. I think there's an intriguing uh, aspect of the case of Kennedy versus the charity commissioners, yeah. where Kennedy, in that case, the judges said, look, there's actually a common law basis for access, <coughs> not the constitution, not human rights, not not legislation, but the common law. Too late to go into all that, but let's just thank you for that point, which allows us to make this related point. Rachel. Hi, thank you. Um, Rachel Adams, I'm the postdoc fellow at the Information Law and Policy Centre, but I've spent the last 10 years in South Africa primarily working on the right of access to information and being the compliance officer for the promotion of access to information act there. And my sort of first introduction into transparency and the right of access to information was from the South African perspective. I have two points. One, very quickly picking up on what you said, which is the other side of the equation, which is when the information that is disclosed, the information that is allowed to be freely in the public domain from transparency is, is itself corrupted and it is itself fake news and what that sort of does to the arguments about democracy or autonomy. And then a question, I'm, Richard, I'm really interested in your um, sort of theory in terms of access to information being couched as an autonomous right in and of itself, which I think is a very valuable argument, but I sort of have questions for it. I think Nora alluded to this earlier. I mean, in the South African context, what's not so that well, it is valid is access to information as a right in and of itself, but where you've seen the most sort of gains is where access to information has been championed as a kind of community right in terms of realizing largely socioeconomic benefits for communities, which goes back to a point that David made. I mean, perhaps it was this 2013 article, but I know prior in South Africa, there was a lot of um, discussions about access to information being a different kind of right and not a sort of civil and political right, not solely conceived as a civil and political right that the state must refrain from interfering with, but a right that Allow, that, it, that, that, that made sure that the state had positive duties to allow access to, so conceived in a kind of socio-economic right. So I know those discussions were certainly going on in South Africa prior to you know, this article you mentioned in 2013, which makes South Africa such a very, very interesting historical example of the right of access to information and the different ways in which it, it could be conceived. So I have to point to the panel. Um, so uh, I think that it's an interesting point about communities, and one of the criticisms that can be made, at least it's free speech rationales about the autonomy argument, it pays too much attention to individuals and not enough to groups of individuals. So I think that can transfer across, and I think one criticism you can make for an autonomy rationale for freedom of information is it doesn't pay sufficient regard to individuals. But I think that, that one way around that is it's not, these aren't binary, <coughs> there isn't one rationale or another rationale. The whole thing is trying to work out, encapsulate what our intuitive reason and explanation is for these. So you can you can say, okay, that's one of the deficiencies of your autonomy rationale, but yeah, one of the benefits of freedom of information is it allows community cohesion and development, so that's not all of it. So I think that's right. Um, I'm going to take it to an opportunity to spin up from there and uh, respond to, to Nora's not being convinced by my theory, it's absolutely fine. And, and I, was, I, 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 was, I was dwelling on it and I was trying to think of a way of, of kind of coming up with a tagline which is persuasive and it's, it's, it's moving away from the idea of knowledge of power, knowledge is power, which, which you, you cited, which only encapsulates part of what we're talking about. 
The other thing is, knowledge is that which allows us to flourish, which is different. It's not about power, it's not about control, it's about allowing an individual to become more of an individual. That's right. Um, to give an example, from, again from South Africa, seeing as we've been heading towards South Africa, and I was there at my Hague project after university. Uh, I went to South Africa and I taught in the dying days of apartheid, I taught English in a Zulu school. And my neighbours were white. Um, you should take me aside and say, don't teach them too much because I want them to still to walk in my garden. And that's always stuck in the back of my mind. And that's exactly what I'm talking about, is we were trying to provide them with information which they were curtailed, which would allow them to flourish. We were trying to allow them not to work on the garden. We were allowing them to take a full part in their society, and a full part um, in, 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 in um, not because of a political reason, but a full part because it allowed them to become more human, and as human as they could possibly be. And that's the bit I'm trying to get at here. I, I, I completely agree with that. I, I think that that's, that sort of doctrine has gone so far that the knowledge that's being produced is now on a mass scale and is being like, somewhat corruptible. I mean, the fake news is, is an example of that, is that we prioritise knowledge and knowledge in huge, huge, huge amounts and constant availability of all sorts of different areas and access points to knowledge that knowledge can now be something that is not, or information can be something that is not necessarily true, but more so can be practical. So we've got time for just two last, okay, three last questions, which I'm going to take together. So if I could ask our audience members to make their questions as succinct as possible, that would be wonderful. So we'll start here, and then we'll take Perry's question, and then James. So please, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Kirkland and I'm from the so-called not belongs to the <laughs> democrat, uh, democratic Russian male country. Uh, and I'm reading my LLM and LSE now. So uh, my question is want to borrow uh, Professor Regan's that the new technology. So especially there is a, a very new technology is blockchain. So I think maybe in the future we can transfer from like uh, archives to database to blockchain. So in this case, I think it really raised uh, post some threat uh, to the uh, the current data protection regime, especially like the right to access and the right to uh, egregious uh, uh, egregious egregious and the right to ratification. Like uh, like today's we are talking about the right to access. Like um, blockchain ha has the typical characteristic of <coughs> in quite, which means. Uh, it may be secret, and it's difficult to give you and give you the access to your personal information or something. So I think it's uh, can the current data protection regime uh, face this situation, and also how can we face the challenge in the future? Nice straightforward question at the end there <laughs> for how to reconcile blockchain with data protection legislation. Thank you, Perry. Right, so I'll try and pack it down as much as I can. So, so uh, I, I was very interested in the ideas about democracy and, oh, I should pause for a moment. I'm Perry Keller, King's College London. I was very interested in the democracy autonomy argument. I, 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 I like uh, aspects of both those. But the thing that I've been thinking about is some of the American research going on. People like David Posen at Columbia has written some good stuff, but he's drawn a lot on Margaret Kolka's work. Uh, big FOI researcher in the States, and uh, also Michael Schutzen's been in this area. And then all of that comes together is saying, look, who uses FOI? In certain areas, it's businesses. The businesses using increasingly sophisticated ways of data extraction, and that's what they're in for. Or in some other areas, you do get individual requests, but a lot of them are litigation related. They're very specific litigation related. So I kind of, for all of that, and I could stand on it quite a bit, but just in time, just come down to the question is, look, you know, the way that a lot of, the way we've been discussing it this year, you've been discussing it, and I would often discuss it the same way, privileges the idea of the citizen, or perhaps the consumer, as this doughty champion that lies at the source of this, that justifies all this. But actually, individuals are overwhelmed. And they are becoming increasingly just the notional participant in this system. Yep. And yes, you can have instances where you can point out that it 
the individual has used this system, but actually it's becoming a game in which the citizen, who's supposed to be at the heart of this, can no longer play. That's a really good point there about this balance and tension between both the powering individual and then rights overload, so to speak, in terms of what you can actually exercise in practice. Yeah, and the key question too of who is actually using these rights. And I thought journalists might come up as well, but I mean they are in a slightly smaller pool. So final question, James, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, um, I'll try to be brief, but first of all, apologize to all of you and to Norm in particular for my late arrival. Uh, I'd like to make two general points and open them for uh, possible reaction. One has to do with the reasons for freedom of information and David Goldberg's example of uh, the consumers union case in the United States, one of the very first ones, against the Veterans Administration for comparative information on hearing aids. Uh, that's a consumer argument for freedom of information or access to information rather than a political one. And it also illustrates the point that that James Corn produced to say freedom of information, access to information, is everybody's second issue. That is to say, it's instrumental. And because of that, he was able to put together a coalition of pressure groups who disagreed on almost everything except the need for their, their desire for a right of access to information. And it is a right and not a freedom because there's a correlative duty of the government. The related point is that. Um, the right of access to information shouldn't depend on the definition of government, but rather on the locus of power. Uh, and the South African Act is a leader in providing right of access to private sector information, which I think is a good thing. I have a caveat about that because it's right of access in order to exercise a right, which is a step in the direction of establishing a need to know. Uh, I think it should not be the reason you want the information, but the nature of the power relationship. And so extending the right of access to information to private sector bodies that exercise public functions or even that exercise uh, economic domination would be a way, a way to move, which many countries are moving in that direction. Uh, so that's the first point. The second one is what is to be done next? And the subject of uh, comparative access to information law and international has already been raised several times. Uh, David Goldberg is right that uh, in the United States there were several states that had rights of access to information along with open government meetings before the 1966 Act. Uh, access to information and data protection have been proceeding along parallel paths. And we now are at a stage where in data protection we had the Council of Europe Convention, followed by the first European then Community Directive, now the GDPR. There was also the UN General Assembly resolution on principles. So we are two steps in the direction of a UN Convention on the subject. On access to information, we're um, a little bit behind, or rather on the side, because there is the Council of Europe Convention on Access to Administrative Information, which is, in my opinion, not very good in the substance, but it is a measure. We also have the Inter-American Court of Human Rights saying that access to information, government information, is a human right, um, which they did, at least in part, I think, because they were in competition with the European Court of Human Rights, which was still and is still stumbling in that direction. Uh, so we have subnational, national, and multinational, transnational instruments already. Um, there's also the European Union's provisions on transparency. Is the next stage to move towards a, a UN convention on the subject? Bearing in mind that with the European experience as um, an object lesson, the process of harmonizing can be one of harmonizing down rather than up. And I'm suspicious enough to think that somewhere someone is probably thinking in the private sector, the way to deal with this whole phenomenon is to get in first and get the instrument drafted 
um, in the weakest possible way. So, some really thought-provoking uh, questions to finish up with. So I'm going to ask the panellists, um, maybe if you don't mind, Richard, if we start with you, and then Kate, and then with Joe, and if you just wouldn't mind providing thoughts, responses you have to those those questions, and then any concluding thoughts you have. Thank you. Yeah, it's in two it, minutes. In two minutes. I'm going to do it quite quickly. Uh, for Perry's question, I think, I'm going to focus on that, and I think I'm going to take something which is in your book and, and give it back to you. So the question is about the individual and their lack of actual, actual use of FOI, how can it benefit them, I think. And I think the answer is that you can, have, you can benefit as an individual from living in a society where you don't actually use that right. So that argument is particularly there in relation to speech. Lots of people, individuals, don't actually use their right for freedom of speech, but they benefit. Uh, from living in a society where there is a right to freedom of speech. Um, this isn't me, this is Raz. Um, similarly, uh, an individual can <coughs> benefit from a living in a, in a society where there is a strong right to freedom of expression, even if they don't utilise it, even if that uh, freedom of information, even if they don't utilise it, even if the companies utilise it, because it creates other benefits which accrue to them from living in that society. I think that would be a way I would answer that. Um, you are unconvinced, so perhaps we can talk about it after. <laughs> Uh, good night. So three quick points. Um, one on the blockchain, we, we're probably right at the outer edge of my technological understanding, but it seems pretty clear to me that governments who have an obligation under freedom of information would not be able to rely on the technological pattern of encrypted information to say we can't provide it. They would actually have a duty as the technological basis of it. If they've got it and they've created it, they would have to unencrypt it and make it available. It's a more complicated question of what's going to happen in relation to the private sector in the private sector, but again, I would argue that however it's encrypted, however the information is, if there's a duty to provide it, they've got a duty to provide it in an unencrypted form. Um, secondly, I just wanted to comment on this debate about um, the sort of underlying philosophical um, normative basis for freedom of information. I think lots of human rights can have several, several um, normative foundations, and I think there's no reason why we shouldn't have Indeed, in speech, we have democracy and autonomy underpinning it. I think there's an important third one in relation to um, freedom of information, which we haven't talked about enough, I think. It's a little bit like uh, an access to courts or access to justice rights, and that is that it is um, an important way of protecting other rights and protecting other things. It, it's instrumental, as the, the word that you use. And, I don't think we should underestimate its importance there. So if I just think about the, um, the South African case I talked about, party political funding, that was effectively using the idea of freedom of access to information to enhance information that voters would have to improve the quality of their right to vote. And I think there's a whole array of ways in which um, freedom of information is probably more similar to access to justice than we often think. Uh, and that would be a third ground. I wouldn't say it's the only ground, but it's another important normative route for um, uh, access to information. Um, the last thing I want to talk about just is where we're going. Um, and I, I have to say that I take the point that freedom of information is not liked by pretty well anybody in power. And um, I, I, I think that it's um, interesting in some ways that data protection in some quite significant ways is sort of leapfrogged over it in terms of the way in which it's developing um, a whole um, framework, international framework of, of how it should work. And I, I, I think we, I think the idea of potentially bringing them together and seeing them as two sides of informational rights, one is our control of information, which is really what data protection is about, and the other is our access to information, might be very good for freedom of information. Maybe we should start thinking about that as um, as, uh, as a way to be thinking about these rights and to be ensuring you put them on agendas in that way and that therefore what we'll be looking to see any convention would actually you know, have both sides of that. I think there will be serious state pushback against them. I, I, I think there are windows of opportunity. I looked at the three dates that David gave us and I thought they were very far apart and, um, and I, think, I think we have to watch out that freedom of information is not going to see a rollback. back. Yeah, I'd agree with that. That point, and just briefly on um, benefiting others, benefiting from just generally about where rights and, and access provisions apply. I think it makes sense to look at the data the same around the slogan loss and uh, the better thinking about the way that you um, make others aware of where some so one person's access to information, but you can focus it on the slogan loss spread. Thank you.
that the events and the things for others. I've, I've done a blockchain point with working on some guidance and maths at the moment. It's from a data protection perspective primarily, but the, the benefit of me being here is that I can take that back now <laughs> and allocate for somebody else. else everyone about, um, tweeting um, the impact on it. It's on it for We're working on an actual blockchain for digital archiving, which we're looking to stand up with a bunch of archives by the end of this year. And the hard part is, immut is immutability and um, when you put something into an immutable form, you lose the ability to, by definition, change it, and therefore you lose the ability to use change as a redress. Um, and um, that's it's, um, it's, uh, um, it defies um, one of the assumptions that we have about information, which is that someone controls it and they can change it. Um, and a distributed ledger, there is no someone in control of it, and it cannot be changed. Um, now that's a really powerful property because you can use it to guarantee that something hasn't been changed. That's what we're interested in it. But it also poses a really big challenge um, that you cannot um, change what's there and there is no one in control. Um, so, and, and we're just gonna have to learn, the technology's not gonna be uninvented. So we're gonna have to learn to live with it. So that, yeah, that sums up how this evening has gone, everyone. We have not shied away from the big questions. We have tackled different jurisdictions in terms of approaches to FOI. We have looked at different governance structures. We've gone beyond legislation in terms of the GDPR, FOI. We've also delved into possibilities provided by common law, the rule of law, administrative law, also considering as well other avenues such as data protection by design, more co-regulatory measures, what future measures we might consider in terms of international regimes, how would they actually operate in the future, and then some really interesting jurisprudential discussions about the philosophical underpinnings of all of these regimes and all of these different approaches and then key questions about how these rights are actually operating in practice, who's actually using them, and, and crucially as well their effectiveness. So please join me in thanking our panelists for a really fascinating discussion this evening, and I thank you for all of your fantastic questions also, and I hope you can also join us afterwards for a glass of wine. Thank you very much.